Stallions should stand alone from human needs and preferences, but never stand alone from theirs. One year ago, I made a social media post about mares and it went viral. Many of you responded to a kind voice that put mares in the limelight with some love. But today I want to discuss stallions and geldings. Human beings have typically both romanticized and feared stallions. Films and books often portray an idealized concept of the horse-human bond based on the stallion stereotype. The image of a wild stallion, of the black stallion, of the big stallion, of the white stallion, of the proud stallion, of the dangerous stallion, the untouchable stallion. And us, the weak, humble human taming a true force of nature, the ultimate expression of danger and wildness and the exceptional human talent it takes to tame it. We have, as horse lovers from the beginning, have potentially soaked ourselves in social messaging, which puts stallions on a pedestal above all the rest. Spoken and unspoken human rules tell us that only serious horse people have stallions, that a stallion is the ultimate test of a horse person's abilities, that because stallions have the reputation of being difficult and dangerous, that if a stallion can trust their human being, that their connection is better than, superior to, and more valuable than the connection between a mare and her human, or a gelding and his human. Because stallions are thought to be harder to train, harder to connect with. But has anyone ever really wondered why? Why have stallions been harder to work with, typically? but more on that in a second. What are we as human beings contributing to this picture? Without us being fully aware of it, have we conflated human gender rules and bias onto our horses and done two things wrong, put stallions in impossible situations and glorified them with anthropomorphic machismo? Anthropomorphic machismo. Have we muddied the waters between human gender politics and horse care and training? Women are worldwide still considered second-class citizens in many countries, and in the Western world deal with lower pay for the same work as men, reproductive health challenges at a political level, and social pressures to be emotionless, non-hysterical, and submissive to men. So too, there is typically a really crappy human narrative associated with mares. I covered that at length a year ago and why I have a low tolerance for it. Whilst our boys and men and stallions are put on pedestals and told that big boys don't cry, boys are strong and emotionless, big stallions are the best, testosterone equals fiery aggression, that men are in charge, that stallions are for the serious and professional horse person. Even if we resist this social conditioning, the human brain is wired for social congruence anyway. We have been soaking in social temperatures which are heavily gender biased. Is this good for horses? Has this helped them to have better lives or worse? I remain deeply concerned that we have passed this subconscious belief system onto our horses. I am one of the first to call out the fear around anthropomorphism as baseless, but this is one case where anthropomorphism is potentially seriously damaging for all concerned. A hashtag of stallion or stallion related will get more engagement on social media than hashtag mare or hashtag gelding. A word stallion in the title of a YouTube video or social media post gets more clicks than mare or gelding, or even more clicks than just horse. Stop, pump the brakes, be thoughtful. I challenge us to deeply reflect on this tendency. Does a stallion excite your equestrian ambition more than any other gender of horse? Like many of us watch extreme sports to see the potential for catastrophic fail. Do we tune into stallions and stallion people for the same reason, then glorify all concerned when everything turns out harmless? If so, why? Is that really our authentic motivation? A belief based upon personal needs, abilities, and life situation? Or is that a belief we have inherited from the world around us? Do we have the self-awareness to know the difference? 
think about it. Which brings me to the broader subject of equine castration and geldings, and this is maybe the part of this video where all of you will stop watching if you haven't already. Since Sereno became my horse, some of my more deeply held thoughts on this subject have become solidified. A horse believed to have been a breeding stallion, but now, after investigation, we know he was a breeding cryptorchid. I have a whole other video on this subject, and from a medical perspective, a cryptorchid is not really considered a stallion. In a few weeks time after publishing this video, I will find out if Sereno was even possibly born a eunuch. So it's more likely that Sereno is a unicorn than a stallion, and I'm totally okay with that. But does this make Sereno less of a horse? Does this make his prior training successes less successful? Does this mean that his gentle nature is explained by a pathologically abnormal testosterone production? Are we, are you, still interested in his story now that he is gelded? And now that we know he is not the full stallion we thought he was? My personal perspective? Sereno is a real horse with an abundance of prior training success, with a naturally excellent disposition regardless of his urogenital organ function. Testosterone is just one of 20 to 30 hormones in a horse's system at any one time. It is just not rational to put so much importance on this one hormone as a hinge pin, as the explaining factor in a horse's life expression and well-being. So are we emotionally invested in the story of a white stallion rather than the story of a horse? At a personal level, I am absolutely guilty of this too. I will click more on the word stallion, just like everybody else. But for a while, it became very tempting to not castrate Sereno. I seriously considered keeping him the way he is. Even in spite of my natural inclinations to not project my human ego onto my horses, very seductively, the thought of being the owner of a stallion felt illustrious, impressive validating, a great challenge. To be in the stallion owner's club meant to take a seat at the table of the creme de la creme of horse owners. To call him my stallion rather than my horse, I did admit stroke my ego stronger. And I'm not saying this is true of all owners of stallions because that is absolutely not the case for all owners of stallions. I'm speaking to you very, very personally now and offering a potential connection about what that might mean about the bigger social picture at play amongst us all. And I'm fully aware that this is a potentially controversial subject. So if we can agree that what I've just spoken about might not be true of everyone, but of many people, perhaps even the majority, what does this mean? that people value stallions as more of a horse above a mare or a gelding? And if so, based on what? Their perceived potential for danger? The perceived expertise needed to train them because of the perceived problems they present? And by association, owners of stallions are better than the rest somehow. What if this is highly probable? What if this is the social conditioning we all subconsciously believe? What if the perceived problems that stallion represent don't belong to stallions at all? What if we created that? What if the stallion problems are all man-made? Because there are plenty of difficult geldings and difficult mares and plenty of super easy stallions. So what is really happening here? Is it kind to create a problem for a stallion then applaud ourselves for handling them as a badge of honor, a testament to our skills? Is it fair to geldings and mares to discount their successes because they are geldings and mares? Horses are a vulnerable species in a human world. They are totally dependent on us. In a domestic setting, our human thoughts, choices, beliefs, and cultural conditioning remain the biggest factors that affect the quality of a horse's life, based very seldom on a primary focus of what the horse needs and wants, but on what everyone else is doing. And that is not a moral failure in us. That is not a moral failure in us. We are just social animals. We cannot help but want to be like everyone else, to fit in. But in trying to fit in, what are we leaving out? Because horses are social animals too. 
To make a departure from tradition and human preference is still a hugely controversial act in the equestrian world. I can personally attest to this. I risk getting cancelled. I risk getting abusive and rude comments and emails about this subject simply by making this video. So why make this video about stallions now? Because I am motivated to advocate for horses who may need advocating for. So hands up if you've ever met a gelding who was pushy, stubborn, naughty, mouthy, biting or nipping, aggressive, cut proud or breeding drive intact despite a castration, protective or strongly bonded to mares and resource defensive of mares. Have you ever wondered why a gelding would suffer behavioral problems associated with being a stallion, if in fact they are not a stallion anymore? because hormones created these problems. Then the brain and body retains what the hormones reinforced. If you ever met a gelding who displayed the above characteristics, you have experienced stallion behavior or male behavior in a horse, meaning these behaviors in horses are often strongly correlated to biologically driven behaviors in stallions and the presence of testosterone in the body. It is more than just personality. It is biology too. The best science we have tells us that the character of a horse is 50-50. 50% genetic predisposition and that stays for life. You cannot train it. And 50% learned experiences that can be changed and added to through life and training. If the horse wasn't born with these stallion testosterone behaviors, then the hormones would have triggered them. Once triggered, the horse reinforces and conditions those behaviors. At some stage during a male horse's early life, testosterone produced in the urogenital tract or in the testes is released into the body. Working in tandem with a whole host of other intricate developments and physiological changes, these hormones trigger specific behaviors and instincts and emotional states. Hormones, instincts, emotions, and behaviors then all work in tandem to produce patterns in a horse. These patterns constitute a horse's individual character, and thankfully, no two horses are the same. But Unlike a human being who is not sexually mature and capable of reproduction until their teenage years, a horse is essentially still biologically an infant, yet physically and developmentally precocious, and they are capable of reproduction very, very quickly. A male colt produces its first sperm between 12 to 14 months of age, while they are naturally still supposed to be drinking milk. By the time a horse is barely one and a half years old, they are biologically capable of breeding. This is a tricky gray area for male horses and an area that I think we need to shed a light on because it leads to so much poor management, mistakes and behavioral issues because that baby colt, sexually capable of breeding is still heavily reliant upon the social bonds of its herd. A herd of mares, stallions, fillies, and even other colts. Horses of different ages, temperaments, and talents. That colt needs that herd socialization exactly at the time that hormones flood their body so that they can learn safe and healthy breeding behaviors and conflict management later in life. So that they can learn to speak horse in a horse society in robust natural herds, inbreeding of these gray area colts is rare due to the strong boundaries set on these colts by the resident stallion and other mares and their mother. But in a domestic setting, being able to replicate these conditions is difficult to impossible, despite the fact that these baby colts are sexually maturing while being physically and emotionally infantile despite the descended testicles and gelding procedures at that age being innocuous, affordable, and harmless and fast, the mainstream practice remains to keep a colt with his testes until he is two, yet wean him when he is six months. So what does he do for a year and a half? Where does he go? What does he learn? Why are we gelding them after two? 
years old because it is believed that it makes a horse develop physically better. But how do we know that it wasn't a lack of access to mother's milk post early weaning that caused poor development in horses gelded before two, but weaned at six months? Again, we ignore the social, emotional, and behavioral maturation of a horse in favor of their mechanical and physical maturation. The cart before the horse. We are putting the cart before the horse, the machine before the being. What good is an arched, thick neck if a horse has no emotional regulation? What good is a fiery, high school, athletic movement if a stallion never learned how to disagree with others in a safe way? Plenty of stallions get injured, so even by the physical health rationale, it's a crapshoot. And plenty of geldings show impressive physical development despite early castration. No robust science supports that gelding a colt at the first moment of testicular dissension leads to a proportionately low prevalence of musculoskeletal injury in high performance fields. No science backs up the belief that stallions enjoy better soundness than a gelding. Testosterone does produce muscle, but no studies of note have been done that adequately compare gelding and stallion populations and track their long-term soundness throughout professional performance careers. Yet, we continue to castrate at two years old and wean at six months. I am pro-castration. Unless someone is a breeder, a full-time equestrian, or can offer a stallion a socially lived life, I do not advocate or recommend stallion ownership. I fall under my own category for stallion ownership, and despite wanting a one mixed herd, I will not rule out stallion ownership in the future, but there remains no evidence that castration will negatively affect a well-kept horse disproportionate to the benefits of remaining entire, and in fact, it can drastically improve a horse's well-being to be castrated. Done young enough, castration under sedation is simple, fast, and a low-risk procedure. I have assisted in multiple castrations, and even last month, I had my colt who was growing up at home with his mother and his herd, I had him castrated. Within minutes, he was back to nursing with his mum, and now he can continue to grow with access to the social intelligence of his mixed herd without risking inbreeding or harm to himself or others. Hopefully my colt, a quarter horse, will suffer less issues later in life due to this. His weaning is a slow and gradual one and he will be able to take milk much longer than most colts, improving his entire long-term health. I have noticed a rise in anti-castration advocacy. I understand the reasons why, but done properly with an experienced and educated vet, it can be done standing in a few minutes with minimal discomfort and a short recovery time on young horses. The older a horse is, the higher the risk. On older horses done under general anesthesia, the testes can be removed without opening the scrotum, which reduces gelding scars and infection risk. If a horse lives a happy life anyway, the lack of testosterone in this system won't cause a post-gelding depression as is often purported. If the only thing making a horse happy is regular hormonal disturbances and surges, is that horse really happy? Gelding scars too are a point of osteopathic concern, but what caused that horse to develop large amounts of pathological scar tissue post-castration? Inflamed bodies produce more scarring than others. With a fiber-based diet, naturally afforded horse keeping, and good health prior to surgery, scarring should be minimal. Gelding a horse is a healthy, positive consideration for the majority of male horses for long-term well-being. But back to stallions for a second. What is the life of a stallion like? Many have lived lives in solitary confinement. Some even without the chance to touch and smell other horses. Many of them start such a life from two years old. They come out of their box to breed, be ridden, and then get put back into their box. If they are very lucky, they may get a small corral to self-exercise. And the really wise breeders sometimes turn their studs out into large fields of mares during breeding season, 
where they often get really beat up by the girls, but kind of low-key loving every minute of this natural breeding process. But then, once breeding's over, they are stabled in boxes again. Most of these stallions were weaned at six months forcibly. And ages six months to two years old lived lives in herds of colts, if they were lucky, or alone if they weren't. Imagine a school of toddlers run by toddlers. Imagine a school of toddlers run by toddlers. What would these toddlers learn about social and emotional intelligence? What behaviors would they miss out on learning because of a lack of access to older, wiser horses, both male and female? What behaviors may become overstimulated due to the excessive exposure to inappropriate herd mates, which stunt or pathologize their mental and emotional development. Now, I am not painting all breeders or raisers of colts with the same brush. If you yourself do not breed or raise colts or stallions this way, then you are watching my videos because my work may resonate with people who are thoughtful, caring, and not afraid to be different. So this does not apply to you. I do not speak about you, but I'm sure that we can all agree that I describe an overwhelming status quo. Internationally, many breeders are becoming comfortable with decades old research that informs us how important it is to not keep or raise horses, any horse this way, and are taking steps to provide a better life for these horses and sometimes for logistical health, safety, and even legal and insurance reasons, stallions remain isolated from the rest of the world. And cults raise themselves in socially, emotionally, and behaviorally deprived and immature environments, ages six months to two, vital years for social and emotional development. The result? Geldings who may appear behaviorally and emotionally baby-brained, and stallions who are no longer horses, can't speak horse, and are a hazard to themselves and to others. Thankfully, it seems that the solution to both these problems is the same. Allow horses to learn from other horses about how to be a horse. Then humans learn what a horse is and what they need and how they learn so that a horse who is a horse can learn what a human is so that we can train horses and work together, not train four-legged equine monsters mutated by inappropriate human intervention. Some stallion stewards are bravely making a change. My friend Nikki, also a Dutch expat in Spain, is a wonderful example of this. And I took a moment to speak with her on Zoom. You can watch that okay, here. So, Nikki, yeah. thanks for being here with me and my bad internet connection today, but um, thanks for joining me to have this really quick conversation about stallions and geldings. And for those who don't know who you are, why don't you introduce yourself quickly? Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. My name is Nikki. I'm originally from the Netherlands, but I moved to Spain uh, six years ago already. Um, I was not born a horse girl, but at, at a young age, I was interested in them. And yeah, it just it just was like a red line throughout my entire life. It's always been around horses in many different shapes and ways and many different paths and journeys. Um, but here I am still with horses. I have two Spanish horses, a, a gelding and a stallion um, who live together here at my place. Um, and yeah, we're doing a lot of liberty work, which I really love. And hopefully eventually we can go out for hex and stuff like that. Super. Oh, Thanks a... so much. So Me? <laughs> you have a Instagram account and horses are your passion and your hobby, right? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. And you have a gelding I, um, and a stallion. It's not. Yes, true. <laughs> yeah. I bought um, my gelding as a stallion, actually. Uh, it was never my intention to have a stallion, but here in Spain, it's very rare to buy geldings. They're often still stallions. And I thought, oh, well, I'm just going to castrate him because back then I didn't have my own place. So he would be in a livery yard and in a livery yard, uh, you can only have a stallion if you have him isolated from other horses. And 
that's not what I want ever. So I got him as a stallion and I gelded him a month later. And then he was a gelding. <laughs> and my other stallion, um, well, my, my, my still stallion, uh, I got him with the same idea, actually. I'm just going to get him as a stallion. And then I thought, because back, by then I had my, my own place. And I thought, well, I can just keep him a stallion, see how it goes. And if it doesn't go right with my gelding, I can, I can always castrate him. So I never had the ambition to have a stallion. But since it went so well with my gelding, I didn't really see a reason to, um, to castrate him. So he's still a stallion and um, they're great together. <laughs> they're like brothers. <laughs> That actually okay. answers my first question. Like, why do you have a stallion? You kind of fell into having a stallion because in Spain, it's hard to buy geldings because everyone keeps their horses entire here in Spain. And the only way you can keep a stallion in a public boarding facility or livery yard is if they're isolated all the time. So your first horse was gelded because you didn't want to isolate him. And your second horse was not gelded because you didn't yes. have to isolate him and he's at home and everything's going well with him and your other horse. Yes, exactly. That's yeah, awesome. I just, I, I rolled into it. Um, I've never, it was never my dream to have a stallion. I think some, some have that dream because they have something magical. It's like what they say. <laughs> uh, but for me, it was, yeah, it just happened. And um hmm. And I, I made a promise to myself that as long as he's happy and he can have like a full life and he's okay with my gelding and my gelding is okay with him, um, he's going to stay a stallion. And if not, if at some point I see that there's a change in his behavior and they're not good together anymore, then I will castrate him right away. That's not a... Yeah, I have that very loud and clear for myself. <laughs> That's awesome. So if you could make one change for the lives of stallions everywhere. If you were given that power tomorrow, what would it be? I would, it's it's the same what I would wish for every horse basically, um, that their needs are met. Like their mm. lifestyle needs are met, that they have access to freedom, forage, friends, that their training needs are met, that they've been trained with kindness, with uh, empathy, with, uh, with soft communication. Um, I wish that the stallions would be seen as as a horse, because basically that's that's what they are. It's the same as geldings and, and mares. They're just horses and they have the same needs. So mm. I would love to change that. Your stallion, now that you've lived with him for a few years, if there's one thing he taught you, what is it? Uh, to stay really true to myself. Mm. Because my gelding is, is the same, uh, but a bit less. But my stallion is really, he needs me to be me and to to trust myself and to, to believe in myself. If I do something that because I read it or because someone told me to, or that I, that I don't fully believe in myself, he picks up on that and he's just like, no, this is not working. So he really wants me to be fully me, <laughs> which is actually That's... a very good lesson. Wow. So did your stallion, I mean, you might not know the answer to this question, did your stallion get social contact from the ages six months or from weaning until the ages of two? Um, I cannot say that for sure because I both got them when they were four, mm. uh, but I don't think so. I don't think they had um, social contact. Mm, because that's the <laughs> that's the standard practice in our area of the world that from weaning until ages two, uh, they might get very little social contact sometimes they're put already into stables or if they do get social contact it's only with other cults with other stallions they're put into sort of medium-sized pens with like lots of other cults but did you ever have the access to see his breeder or the place where he did come from before you met him uh yes with Macayo, i bought him straight from the breeder um he was actually sold if I understood it right, because back then my Spanish wasn't that good yet, <laughs> because he was a stallion, but he didn't want to breed. He was not interested in breeding, so he was useless to them, to say it very hard, but yeah, it's the way it is. Mm. Um, I got him straight from the breeder, and I also saw the other horses, and um, 
that was actually a very nice feeling. I didn't get a Lune from the breeder and at four years old, he already had at least four different homes because he was labeled very difficult, et cetera. Um, so I don't know much of his background. I saw all the different owners in his passport and I thought he probably has quite a story, but I don't know the story and, um, and that's okay mm. too. Mm. Well, that's the case with so many horse owners. We just don't know for sure the story before they came to us. Sometimes we can make very good guesses based on the behavioral responses they will have to us in training now. Uh, that tells us a lot sometimes about their background. But you mentioned that Elune, he was labeled in the past as a problematic horse, but is he, as your stallion, safe, happy, uh, gentle and reasonable to be around and to handle now? Yes, definitely. It took a while. I think it almost took a year. Mm. Uh, not that he was like dangerous or anything or like stallion -y before that, but he was very shut down. Um, so he didn't really connect or interact with humans. He was just very obedient. Um, it took a year for that to get out of his system and to really open himself up and to trust but on an everyday basis like the only thing he has is that he's very mouthy but i'm working on that because it also has a physical reason but other than that he is very he's actually easier than my gelding because he's very down to earth he has a lot of confidence he's very like reasonable in situations he's like oh okay yeah that's fine well, my gelding can be, oh, I'm probably going to die here. <laughs> um, very laid back. <laughs> and I actually, um, like, my boyfriend has ridden him, and he has very little ridden experience, but he felt safe enough that I could just put him on, and he would just walk around and very calm. And, yeah, he's actually, uh, he's, he's really great. He's That's easier amazing. than than my gelding, for sure. <laughs> Because the stereotype yeah. is that stallions are yeah. difficult and crazy and only for like expert people and that geldings are for beginners, for people with less skill with horses. But you're saying that in your experience with these two horses, that the reverse is true. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, my stallion, you can just walk with him and, and he's he's fine with with a lot of things I don't know if a beginner would ask like more difficult things of him then he would probably get confused and, and he won't just do it um, but my gelding really needs a, a super confident person who knows what he's doing because otherwise he's just not going to do anything <laughs> mm, I'm so and happy I've been, to hear I've that I've been actually raised with the same thought I've been um, I've been raised with the same thought that stallions are like dangerous and crazy and they need to be kept in isolation because otherwise they will attack other horses and you need to handle them with like chains and whips and whatnot to be able to control them so not having any stallion experience when I got my first stallion I was like okay well I'm not gonna I'm not sure what I'm gonna get myself into but like from the very first week I thought oh gosh all these stories are not true <laughs> I mean Yes, they could become like that if their lifestyle makes them like that and if their training makes them like that, if they're like isolated and always treated with with force and with fear and, and with, with heavy tools, etc., they become that stereotype. But it's not what they are from like from birth. They're actually very awesome laid back animals if you keep them the right way. And I think that's for many people a, a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. Definitely a huge challenge because it's not socially acceptable, especially in public environments, to keep uh, stallions in socially in integrated herds. And so they keep the horses in isolation and then they create a problem where the stallion is dangerous. But in order to get a different type of stallion, we have to do a different type of horse keeping. Has that been your experience? Yes, definitely. Uh, there's not such thing as a, a dangerous stallion, but they can be created like by humans because of the lifestyle they are wow. they're getting. But yeah. I don't think they're um, they're nasty animals or anything. They're they're yeah. really um, they're great, but 
yeah, you have to be able to give them a full life and have have all their needs met. Otherwise, mm -hmm. yeah, they can become difficult. So um, it, does your gelding display any behavior similar to your stallion or does he retain any of his stallion behaviors that you recognized when you got him? Um, he's actually pretty much the same. Hmm. He didn't change much other than that he lost a little bit of confidence, but I cannot say for sure that's because of the gelding because many things happened around that time. He was moved and he got a friend and then he got a different friend. So um, that could also be the reason that he has a bit less confidence. But other than that, he's just as spicy. He's actually spicier <laughs> than my stallion. Mm. He's, um, yeah, he's really great. Because that's a, often a the reason. And that hasn't changed at all. <laughs> yeah. That's often the reason I find why people yeah, I know. choose to have a stallion. It's that because, and mane. Yeah, they want a long mane, a big neck, and a spicier character. So they want they think they should then get a stallion. And many people don't want to castrate a stallion because they believe that there will be a massive change in the horse's personality, that their body, they will look worse, that they will get depressed because they no longer have testosterone. But you're saying that that wasn't your experience. No, not at all. I mean, the only reason he lost some mane is because he rubbed it off. <laughs> But other than that, uh, he still has a full mane and a very long forelock. Um, he has all his personality. And of course, I, I only knew him as a stallion for a month and he was castrated. Um, but he has developed a really cool personality and he, he has not changed at all. And he hasn't lost his spark or no, he's uh, still uh, very amazing. <laughs> So compared to your stallion, your gelding is not dull or less sensitive. Oh, no, <laughs> not at all. It's actually the other way around. I would say my stallion is more dull <laughs> than my gelding. I mean, mm -hmm. my stallion is more, um, he wants to interact more with my gelding. Like he's inviting him to play more. And my gelding is saying no to that more often than the other way around. Um, but that's, I don't think that has to do with, gelding and stallion it's just their personalities they just mm. I mean my gelding is w more playful with me than my stallion so it's just what they prefer as well I cannot really say that's a stallion gelding difference but no my gelding is not at all dull <laughs> so um your stallion does not give you more magical connection compared to your gelding that you're saying that for you it's possible to have like a deep connection with both of them Oh, yes, definitely. I have a way better connection actually with my gelding um, than with my stallion. With my stallion, it's still, it's growing, but it's growing slowly. And it's actually more difficult with him, I find, because he demands me to be true to myself. And that's a difficult subject for me. And if I'm not that, then there's no connection. So with him, it's, it's, um, it's actually harder. I love this because um, you are a living, breathing example of breaking the stereotypes of the gelding and stallion uh, stereotypes. You're breaking those um, those human storylines and narratives around the gelding and the stallion. And you're living proof that this is just maybe a story that we have made up and told ourselves that, sure, you're just one horsewoman with two horses, but if it's true for you, then it must be possibly true for so many horses and so many horse people that the stories we tell ourselves about our geldings and our stallions might not be real at all. And we're forcing our horses to fit like a human idea that has nothing to do with them. I just love it. I love hearing about your horses and how you've broken that stereotype. And you didn't want to break the stereotype. You've just walked into it and your horses broke the stereotype right yeah, yeah that's that's exactly how it went yeah it was mm. never my goal but um yeah i'm happy uh, i'm happy to do that i'm happy to uh to share my experience and, and to tell about my horses and yeah i'm also happy to hopefully um because i share a lot about them and their life together and and what they need and what i think that my stallion and gelding need which is which is the same exactly 
um, I just want them to be happy horses with, yeah, with a good life with each other. And of course, it would be even better if the herd was even bigger. And who knows that might happen in the future. But for now, at least they have each other and and they're really good together. And I just wish that for for every stallion. And I think if you can offer them that, then sure, if he's happy and everything, he can be a stallion. But if you cannot offer him that, then then gel him. It's that's the way I see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question for now. This is a huge guess because you'll never find this out for sure, but I'm just humor me. Maybe you can make a guess. If you took Elune, mm -hmm. your stallion, and you took him away from your gelding and you put him in a stable and that was his life, do you think he would become a problematic horse once again? Oh, I'm actually sure that he would. And I can I can say that for sure because um, it's not exactly the same situation, but when he had an injury, I had to put him in like a sort of a stable and I didn't really have a stable. So I created something with, with really high walls and something that I would think it was impossible to get out of. And because he always lived in a stable before, I thought he would be fine. But he actually managed to jump out <laughs> and, and it was a crazy high jump and he could have really injured himself, but luckily he didn't. Um, and I tried to put him in a similar sort of stable a few times more, but it was just, it was not happening. He was, he was just so stressed immediately and wanting to, to get out of that small space. He was really not okay. So I think if you put him back in his old life, he would become problematic again, for sure. Yeah. Wow. Well, it seems like he's talking to you and you're listening. I'm doing my absolute best. <laughs> yeah. Well, Nikki, I want to thank you so much for humoring me today to have this discussion and for sharing uh, your horses with us so honestly and openly and bravely. Um, I'm sure there are people who are watching and listening you um, speak about your stallions and geldings who might be seeing hope that they can do it differently too. So I want to thank you for that. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me.